Well, unfortunately, my colleague, uh, our researcher Daniel, who organized this event, mm -hmm. is being taken care of today. Uh, so mm -hmm. I've been yep. thrown in the deep end uh, with, with no introductory remarks. So I'll just mm -hmm. read to you from our uh, event schedule here. Uh, this lecture uh, will tackle this challenge. Uh, sorry. In the current day environmental discourse, the concern of overpopulation and resource depletion looms large. Uh, if population growth grows unchecked and consumerism remains rampant, resources will run dry and our collective future will be in peril. This lecture will tackle this challenge and provide a contrarian perspective. Uh, Professor Gail Cooley uh, will provide new data showing us that resources will actually become more abundant over time thanks to human innovation and market based entrepreneurial discovery. Uh, I, for one, am incredibly excited uh, to listen to what he has to say. And on that note, I will hand over. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here in your lovely, uh, in your lovely city. Um, I want to recognize, first of all, my, my co-author, Dr. Marion Tupi of the Cato Institute. So uh, I asked somebody the other day, I said, Adam Smith Institute's like the Cato. And they said, no, mm -hmm. Cato's like the Adam Smith Institute. So, uh, yeah. uh, I want to acknowledge him. I, too, come from an island uh, place. Uh, I'm, I'm from Hawaii, uh, oh, wow. 50th state in the United States. Mm -hmm. So. I'm used to living on an island. In fact, if you look at our flag in Hawaii, uh, <laughs> it's the only state flag that has another country's flag in the flag. Yeah. And it was the 50th state. So I think that you guys are trying to repatriate uh, our country. <laughs> so we've got this beautiful Union Jack up in the corner of our state flag. So it's a great honor for me to be here with you this evening and to share uh, what we discovered, Mary and I, over the last four or five years of studying this relationship between prices between resources and population. Now, if you have the opportunity to see this movie, uh, Avengers Infinity War, you might recall this character, uh, Thanos. He makes a statement in the movie, says the universe is finite, its resources finite. <clears throat> if uh, life is left unchecked, life will cease to exist. It needs correction. Remember that part of the story? And then he proceeds to try to wipe out half of that life in the universe, <laughs> right? He tries to accomplish this. Well, where did he get his idea? Where did this, you know, it was just a character in a comic book. Mm -hmm. What, where did the, this come from? Well, it was, Thanos was originally introduced in 1973. And um, what was happening at that time? Well, in 1968, this guy, uh, professor of biology at Stanford, uh, published a book called The Population Bomb. And uh, he makes this statement, society needs rescaling. If you're familiar with that book at all, it was this uh, book that, that sold millions and millions of copies. And he was on TV, it seemed like every other week, uh, talking about mm -hmm. his ideas uh, about this population problem we were facing. This is back in 1968. He says, society needs rescaling. We've got to reduce the size of the entire human enterprise. Doesn't that sound like Thanos? Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of the same thing, right? Well, where did the early, if we go back and say, where did early get his ideas? If we dig deep and deep enough and go far back enough, we'll, we'll encounter this guy, uh, uh, the Reverend yeah, Malthus, yeah. Thomas Malthus. Mm -hmm. He writes this book, uh, The Principle of Population, he actually uh, published it anonymously in 1798. And in this book, he makes this, uh, makes this statement. He says, population, when unchecked, increases at a geometrical ratio. In other words, it does this, right? Subsistence increases only at a rhythmic ratio. A slight acquaintance with the numbers will show the immensity of the first power in comparison to the second. Notice that he's kind of a little bit uh, dismissive of anybody that might uh, want to question the math of his model. Um, yeah, I find that kind of interesting that he would, he would say that. Uh, you know, anybody that's familiar with Excel uh, and discovers how exponents work has a lot of fun modeling. Um, and that's kind of what we think of him as the, the father of modeling and uh, using models to try to predict out into the future. <clears throat> so, uh, Malthus did offer one caveat, though. He made this statement. Oh, before we quote that statement, take a look at the chart. You all agree with this? He said, over time, you could have this arithmetic gain that's linear against this uh, geometric gain that has this exponential feature. He said, well, population is getting this. But we can uh, we can only feed at the uh, at the linear level. So what's going to happen? We're going to have this collapse if we continue to grow our population. Recall in 1798, what was the population on the planet? About a billion people, right? We got how many today? 
Nine. Yeah, seven nine. point eight, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. Seven point eight. But he makes this really interesting statement in his book. He says, mm -hmm. "It is an acknowledged truth in philosophy that just mm -hmm. that a just theory will always be confirmed by experiment." Mm -hmm. Right. So okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. You guys say correct. We say right. <laughs> right on. Right on. So, so here's the point: is let's test Malthus by Malthus's own standard that the evidence should confirm the theory. Okay. All right. Now, um, one of the beauties of being a professor is that you get to uh, you get to kind of say whatever you want to and never really be held accountable. <laughs> Isn't that true? Mm. Theorize okay. all kinds of stuff, but I'm never really held accountable. Well, I want to introduce you to this guy. I think a lot of you probably already know know this guy. I know the guy here that talked about uh, Julian. Uh, met Julian Simon. Who's the guy that met Julian? Me. Yeah, our president. I knew him. Right? He was a friend. He was a friend. Julian Simon gets this book, reads it. The first time he reads it, he agrees with the with the hypothesis. Says, "Oh yeah, that, that sounds like it makes sense. It's logical." But as a good economist, he said, you know, maybe I should go back and look at the relationship between two variables, population and resources, and how do we measure resource scarcity in economics? We do it with prices. Prices. So he began to, to look at all these prices. He goes back and he tries to look at all of the data he can for historical prices. And what did he conclude? He concluded that that uh, as, as human population increased, uh, scarcity actually decreased, which would be another way of saying as the human population increased, abundance increased. Mm -hmm. So he keeps digging and he keeps doing this research and finally he's got enough sufficient that he writes this article, gets it published in uh, Science, which is one of the leading uh, journals in the US. It's kind of like uh, Nature here, Science there. Uh, so he writes this article, and the title of the article is uh, uh, Resources, Population, Environment, an Oversupply of False Bad News. And it attracted more attention than any article that had ever been published uh, in that journal. So when Early uh, heard about it and read about it, he was enraged. And, uh, you know, they, the, the two did have this agreement. They both agreed that population and resources have a relationship with each other. So if we were to scale this off and say, here's the resource abundance, here's population. Ehrlich argued that if you increase population, what happens to abundance? It decreases. Simon, on the other hand, argued the opposite. That as population increased, abundance increased. Mm -hmm. So they come to this um, come to this situation, and Simon tells Ehrlich, well, let's have a public debate about this. Ehrlich refused to debate in public. Mm -hmm. And so Simon, in frustration, says, well, why don't we bet? Let's bet. And the terms of the bet were pick any, any resource you want to. Pick a non-renewable resource. It's got to be more than one year. I'll bet up to $10,000 with you, and let's see what happens to the price. So Ehrlich jumps at this deal. <laughs> Ehrlich says, uh, yeah. I'll do that. In fact, two of his other professor friends join the join in the bet. They pick five uh, metals: copper, chromium, nickel, tin, and tungsten. They put two hundred dollars on each one of these. So the total bet was a thousand dollars, and they held the bet for ten years. So from nineteen eighty to nineteen ninety. So at the end of ten years, what happens? What happens? <clears throat> Well, the end of 10 years, it was inflation adjusted. So in that 10-year period, inflation went up by 58%. So $1,000 should be what? $1,580, right? So what had happened to the price of these five metals? They had barely moved. They were still $1,000. That's like $3.96. So uh, we got these five metals. What, uh, what happened? Well, behold. China's one of the most important yeah. checks ever written in economics. <laughs> <laughs> one of the most important checks for five hundred dollars, seven five hundred seventy-six dollars and seven cents. So, in October of nineteen ninety, 
the real prices had fallen by 36%. So it was incredible. You know, it was pretty astonishing because during that same decade, we added 800 million people to the planet. Now, a lot of people think that uh, early was unlucky, that Simon just happened to pick a, pick a lucky decade. Mm. So, uh, uh, he also noticed that he had his wife sign the check. <laughs> <laughs> So he just sends him a sends him a check in a sale and yeah. Simon calls him back up again. He sends a letter back to him and says, You want to bet again? Yeah. Just bet the same five and do it for 10 years. Well, I'll do it for 20,000. And Ehrlich refused to take up that. <laughs> he wanted to bet on something else like quality of life or something that's really subjectively really unmeasurable. Uh, so the point is, is um, where did these three guys make their mistake? Did they make a mistake? <laughs> Malthus, Ehrlich, and Thanos. Where did they make the mistake? <laughs> well, let's first of all take a look at life. One of Malthus's arguments was that life was going to decrease, right? You're going to have, you're at the end of the resource, you're going to have fewer people living shorter. So let's look at the growth in life. <clears throat> now, uh, the word, we get the data on this is our world of data. Do you consider that a credible source? Yeah, it was, they seem to be a pretty credible source. So when we take a look at that, What's happened to the number of people on the planet? Well, we started a billion, and now we're at 7.8 billion. So we've increased the population by 680% over these uh, 224 years. But the other factor that's, that's as important, if not important, is life expectancy. How long did people live? In 1800, how long did people live? Well, they lived about 28 years. Life expectancy was 28 years. Now that's kind of surprising to us. It's 28 years. Why was it so low? Well, when you walk to one of these cemeteries around here, I noticed 200 years ago that you have a bunch of these little tombstones, right. and then next to the little There's tombstones, you've got these uh, women that are like 22, and they both have the same last name. So we've been able to do, do what with with infant mortality, and then we add to that. And medicines, antibiotics, and all of these things, and suddenly life expectancy grows up. So what we should, what we really should be thinking about is life years. Now, when we combine those two together, really it's total life years is what we should be looking at. And that's the population times life expectancy. So how many people do you have and how long are they expected to live? So let's just kind of plot that out. So we go, uh, Years from 1800. Oh, by the way, I'm going to take all these slides, and uh, ASI will have these slides, and you can uh, go download them. So um, you'll be able to go back in and look at all these slides that, that I've used here today. So let's do a chart here, percentage change. So 1800 to 2020, population has increased by 157%. Excuse me, life expectancy. We went from 28 years to 73 years. So we have this increase in life expectancy, but we also have this increase in life, right? Uh, population, the number of people on the planet. And you really have to multiply those two together to get how many additional life years you have. And when we do that, we end up with about 20 times more life years today than we had in 1800. Another way to think about that is if we go back to uh, 1800 and we look at life expectancy in years and population, 1800, we had a billion people on the planet living about 28 years. <clears throat> so we had 28.5 billion life years, right? A billion people, they're going to live 28 years, multiply the two together, and that tells you how much life year you're going to have. Well, what is it today? Well, first of all, we grew from 28 years to 73 years. We all get another, what, 44 years of life. Okay, is that valuable to you? I think it has some kind of value. Not only did we, did we grow in this dimension, we also grew in this dimension. So now we have almost 8 billion people on the planet. So we've increased those two. If we compare this box to this box, 28.5 billion life years against 571 billion life years, the green box is 20 times larger than the red box. And that's where we get the 1,900% increase. And if we table it, uh, so I'm going to send you these slides so you can go back and spend some time with them. Check my math, please. Mm. Uh, 1,800 billion people, 28.5 uh, years of life. 
So 20.5 billion uh, years of life expectancy. Today, 7.8 billion people, 73 years. That's how we get to 571. It's the comparison of those two numbers that really count. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we take uh, Malthus's first argument about life. He said, we're at the end of the rainbow. We're ready to go like this. What did we actually do? No, we went like this. We went up this other curve. We went up this other curve. So what we're seeing is this exponential growth in life. Okay? It wasn't, uh, he was correct in the, in the sense that life does do this. The question is, what have resources done then? We've got to compare that to the resources. Okay. So, back to Thanos. Thanos was correct. He was half correct. The number of atoms in the universe is kind of fixed, right? In fact, when you think about the planet, the number of atoms on this planet are fixed, aren't they? So he is correct in that respect. So where did he make his, make his mistake? Well, he made the mistake that people who haven't uh, done economics make. Economics is not about atoms. It's not about counting atoms. Economics is about knowledge. It's about knowledge. Okay? And knowledge is not subject to the laws of physics. Uh, you might know Thomas Sowell. He's a great historian economist. Um, he writes in his book, Knowledge and uh, Decisions, he says, the caveman had the same natural resources at their disposal as we have today. The difference between their standard of living and ours is the difference between the knowledge they could bring to bear on those resources and the knowledge used today. Sol goes on to observe that while market economies are often thought of as money economies, they are still more so knowledge economies. Economic uh, transactions are purchases and sales of knowledge. So it's knowledge is what we're really thinking about. George Gilbert, uh, you might know him, he makes this interesting observation along those same lines. He says the difference between our age and the Stone Age is entirely due to the growth of knowledge. We're not getting more atoms. We have the same number of atoms on the planet today that Adam had. So what's the difference? It's knowledge, the growth in knowledge. In 2018, these two uh, were awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics for their work in really bringing this idea that knowledge is what explains our economic system and growth in knowledge. So um, William, it was Paul Romer and William Nordhaus Nordhaus writes this beautiful paper about the time price of life. How much time does it take you to earn the money to buy an hour's worth of life? And he goes back and compares this. If we just go back, he went back to 10,000 BC, but if you just go back to 1820, 1830, to get one hour of light that's equivalent to this, about a thousand lumens of light, it would take you about three hours of work. So I got to work three hours to be able to turn the light on for one hour. So Sun went down, most of the time people went to sleep. Today, how much time does it take to earn the money to get one hour of life? It's about 0.116 of a second. So we've had this phenomenal increase in the abundance of light. And I think light is one of the leading indicators of being able to see how we've, we've been able to grow in our prosperity. So, <clears throat> Um, okay, I'm a professor. I can't help myself. Time for a quiz. <laughs> How many keys are on a piano? 88. Who said 88? 88. You do. Uh, you're Is that the black 88? and white? Oh, the black and white. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, Jordan Peterson. Get a prize. I tried to get a uh, prize when I was late, but I got a Jordan Peterson tie here. Let me, let me throw this back here to you. I'll just throw it to you. Okay, 88 keys, right? He's right. So here's the next question. How many songs can you, how many songs are in a piano? A song. How many songs are in a piano? It's a trick question. There's no songs in a piano. Where do songs come from? Human. Yeah, the human mind. And that number's got to be what? Infinite. 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 We have infinite. So I said you. So if you know Jordan Peterson or you know somebody that likes Jordan Peterson, you got a tie for it. Okay. 
All right. So it's infinite, isn't it? And what's the difference? What's that do to you? Well, it's not the number of keys on the keyboard. It's what you can do with those keys. It's this value that we can create from this infinite ability to create this beautiful music, right? Now, Thanos and Malthus and Ehrlich would say you got 88 keys, you must only have 88 songs, <laughs> right? Because they're thinking what? They're thinking in atoms. They're thinking in the physical world. They're not thinking in the, in the value, knowledge, method of the world. Yeah, they're, they're not thinking in the value world, the knowledge creative world, world, the creative world. If we look at the number of elements, you guys probably, you know, you started this table, right? The periodic table, we've got, what, 118 of these elements we've identified, about, what, 94 of them are present on the earth that we can identify. About six of those are pretty scarce. So we're left with about 88 elements on the planet. So we've got 88 elements to work with. We've got 88 keys to work with. So how many possible combinations of those elements are there and how many possible songs are there with those limited number of physical resources? What can we do with the combinations, potential combinations of those resources? Now, uh, our friend, Jordan, who, who's Jordan Peterson? You know, he's big in the U.S. If you're a young guy under 30, you're probably right away. You guys want to make sure and answer the next question here. He's okay. a Canadian uh, and yeah. a professor at Toronto and recently had a dispute and resigned, and he's got a podcast, and he deals with psychology, and he's written, I think, The Rules of Life. You guys need to kind of look into it. He's, he's this great philosopher, psychologist, but he also does economics a lot. He talks about economics a lot. And my co-author, Mary Tupi, has interviewed with him and talked about these ideas. So anyway, he makes this interesting statement. He says, compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. If you compare yourself to who someone else is today, you're always going to lose, right? But if you can compare yourself to who you were yesterday, you can actually have an influence on that. So back to uh, George Gilder, he makes these interesting three propositions. He says, wealth is knowledge, and growth is learning, and money is time. From these three propositions, we can actually derive a theorem, and that theorem is that you can measure the growth and knowledge with time. And that's what we're attempting to do, to measure the growth of knowledge with time. So scarcity is about what we want. Abundance is about what we have. You really can't measure scarcity because my wants are unlimited, right? So how do I compare what I have against infinity? Versus abundance, I can measure that. I can measure what I had last year, versus what I have this year. And I can look at that rate of change between those two points in time and draw a conclusion about whether I'm better or worse off. Now, when you go to the market to buy a loaf of bread, what's more important to you? The number of loaves on the shelf or the price? Quality. <laughs> <laughs> Am I supposed to hear that? <laughs> Price. Isn't the price more important? I mean, the number of loaves are kind of interesting, yeah. but the price is the information. The price has more information than the quantity, right? The price has more information content than the quantity of something because we make our decisions based on the price. So that's the first uh, thing that we also consider. Now, <clears throat> what I'm going to explain to you, or try to try to uh, explain to you, is this framework that we use, and it's, we call it the two the two B Cooley framework. And it's a way that we quantify and measure abundance. We have these 13 equations that we use, and they're real simple. Uh, we look at abundance at the personal level, at the individual level, what is happening in your life personally, and then we compare that to the population, what's happening to the overall population. And then we actually do some elasticity of population calculations that have to do with you change this variable here, what happens to that variable there. So, <clears throat> Another thing that we, uh, we remind ourselves is that we buy things with money, but we pay for them with time. Isn't that true? Yeah. You get ready to go buy something, you think, well, how much time do I have to work to yeah. earn the money to buy this? Thing? So we're kind of already in tune to the thinking in time. What we're arguing is you need to push that further and actually think in time. If you think in time instead of money, this whole different perspective opens up to you. And this isn't a new idea at all. Julian Simon talked about it before Julian Simon talked about Adam Smith. Mm -hmm. Our guy in the window here. 
He talked about it. He said, what? The real price of everything is the toil and trouble of acquiring it. What is bought with money is purchased by labor. He was really talking about things are really your time. It costs you your time to buy things. So we have money prices. When they're expressed in pounds and pence or dollars and cents, and we have time prices that are expressed in hours and minutes. Okay. Now, to, to derive a time price is really pretty simple. You just take the money price and divide it by a person's hourly income. Okay. So if something costs 20 pounds and I'm earning 10 pounds an hour, it means it's a two hour, the thing is a two hour time price. Okay, we can actually take that equation and look at all kinds of things. Now, why do we like time prices over money prices? We think it's better for four reasons. First of all, when you have innovation, it actually shows up in prices, but it also shows up in wages, right? People's income goes up when you have innovation. Prices go down, but income also goes up. So if you're looking at the time price, you're actually getting both those pieces of information in one number. So you're more fully capturing innovation if you look at time prices, because it, it's, it's, it's a ratio, not just a number, it's a ratio. The second reason we like it is because you can avoid all this contention associated with what's the inflation? What am I doing when I go from nominal prices to real prices? What's the GDP to play? Do you have something like that here? GDP to play there, CPIs, uh, PPIs, IPCs, PPPs. You have all of these indexes that economists try to develop to convert my nominal price back to a real price. Well, you can avoid all of that contention because you're not measuring. You're looking at what was the nominal price at that point in time and what was the nominal income at that point in time. And then you have your ratio and you have your time price. So we like it for that respect. We avoid all this subjectivity of people trying to convert back to the real price. The third reason we like it is you can go anywhere. I can go to France in 1850, look at the price of bread, look what wages were, calculate the time price of bread in 1850. I can compare that to the prices of oranges in London today. But what's the currency? We don't care about the currency. The currency and the wage rate are the same, in the same uh, uh, basis, so you don't have to worry about currency either. So I can go anywhere, anytime, using any currency and look at any product or service and calculate what the time price was. And then the fourth reason is, uh, is time is this universal constant. Uh, we have this international system of, of uh, units that we have uh, seven metrics, right? That SI has. And six of those seven go back to time. So uh, we like it because we're going to this universal uh, idea of time. And uh, just want to uh, talk about that a little bit more. As the only irre irreversible element in the universe with directionality imparted by thermodynamic entropy, time is the ultimate frame of reference for basically all measured values. So we're trying to take and use time as a measurement. Instead of money, let's use time. You know, because time can't be inflated, it can't be counterfeited. Um, your, your great Isaac Newton spent half of his life trying to figure out how to counterfeit gold. Why? Because he wanted the pound to have this standard of value. It couldn't be counterfeited. It couldn't be counterfeited. <laughs> all right. No matter how much money we have, the other thing is time is, is we all have perfect equality in time. We all get 24 hours a day. It's fixed, but it's also constant flow. Uh, you know, uh, and no matter how rich you are, you can't buy time. Mm -hmm. If that was true, rich people would never die, mm -hmm. right? So you can't buy time. So it really forms this way that we can go to a number that gives us a much more objective way. Uh, we think it's elegant, we think it's simple, we think it's intuitive. So we start with time prices. So first application of our framework is we go back to this bet between these two guys. I was just going to say, I mean, if you're in America, rich people can afford the best health care, which buys them more time on this planet. Yeah, but you got to live in America, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, look at life expectancy. Is it higher in the U.S. or in the U.K.? Mm. Okay. True, but is it higher in the states which have the best health care and the highest income? 
<laughs> let's let's hold that question for our human aid time. Okay, well, we can go look at the data and see what the data says about it. Okay, so back to this bet. So our question was, if you had this bet today, who would win? Well, one of the a couple of the critiques of the bet was that it only it was only for five items, and it was only for ten years. So you had a data set of five times. You only had a data set of fifty points. So what we did is let's expand that from five items to 50 items. So we went beyond just these five metals and we included energy. So we have crude oil, we have coal, we have natural gas. We also looked at food items. So we have beef, chicken, wheat, rice. We also added materials. So we have wood, cotton, rubber. And then we looked at metals, aluminum, uh, iron. And then we have uh, these precious metals of gold and silver and platinum. So we end up with these 50 commodities, right? Kind of the commodities, if you want to go to an island by yourself, what do you want to take with you? I want to take these 50 items with me because I can build a civilization with these 50 material items. So we, we call it the basic 50. And then we analyze it from 1980 to 2020. So we got 40 years worth of data. So now we have 2,000 data points instead of 50 to look at. So we, we named this index the Simon Abundance Index in honor of Julian Simon, this work that he, he done. Now, where did we get the, uh, the price information? Well, fortunately, the World Bank um, and the IMF keep track of prices and they report prices every month, nominal prices every month. So we can go to the World Bank, go back into their data set and find all of these nominal prices for all of these, com uh, these commodities. In international market, I think 43 of them we use a little bit, four and seven of them we use IMF to get the data. So we've got this credible source for data. We're not actually producing that data, we're just analyzing the data. And then the second thing is what do you use for the denominator? So you get all the money prices to get the time price, you gotta figure out the denominator, the rate per hour that people <coughs> have. Since these are global prices, how do you get a good proxy? We don't have somebody that publishes what the average hourly income is on the planet. What we do have, however, is GDP by country, and we also have an organization, the Conference Board, that publishes, they do research on uh, hours worked, right? So your income can be like this, but if the hours work goes down like this, your actually hourly income is going up, right? So that's one problem with GDP. If my GDP is not moving, the people are working less and less hours every year, your GDP per hour is actually going up. So that's what we try to do is take these countries we have data on, GDP data, and match them up with the countries that we have hours worked with and get a GDP per hour work. And we think that that gives a pretty good basis for what's happening on the planet overall in terms of what people's income is doing, that rate of change in their income. So we use that. Remember what we had? So time prices are the money price divided by the uh, GDP per total hours work. So what do you think happened? Well, when we, when we began this research, we thought there's gotta be one of these 50 commodities that's, that's become more scarce in the last four years. Which one do you think, which, which one do you think has become more scarce? In other words, less abundant. Yeah, we thought there'd be one. What we discovered is not a single one. They've all gone down in the time price, right? Every one of them got down in the time price. What do you think the overall average was for the 50 items? Well, if you read the paper and cheated on this test, <laughs> you find that the time price is actually falling by 75%. And what that means, remember you can take time, you can take price, hold price constant, look at quantity, or you can hold quantity constant, look at the price. What that means is for the time it took you to earn the money to buy one basket of these goods in 1980, you get 4.03 baskets, right? You walk into the store and everything's 75% off. It means I get four for the price of one. So that's essentially what's happened over the last four years on the average for, for these, not a single one went down. Now, <clears throat> I think uranium had dropped by 90% and zinc had dropped by like 16%. So all of them are showing this this continual increase in abundance. So time price multiplier is really this ratio of, of the time price at the start divided by the time price at the end. So what's that mean if I go from one to 403, 4.03, it means that I've had a 300% increase in abundance. 
right? It's not measuring the time price as it's gone down. It's really measuring this abundance. If you hold your time constant, how much is, how much more can you get or less you get for an hour's worth of your time? So we get this 303 percent uh, percentage change. If we look at that rate of change over 40 years, it shows us that your personal abundance is increasing about three and a half percent a year, which means about every 20 years, you're twice as you get twice as much for the same amount of time. Kind of every generation gets twice as much for the same amount of time. Now recall, part of what we're trying to analyze is this relationship between resources and population. So let's go back and take a look at the, uh, the population. The way we do that is we look at the personal, and then we multiply your personal abundance times the rate of change in population to see if that also tells us something. So think about personal abundance as, you guys eat pizza here? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Think about that as the slice. How big is your slice? Okay, that's the personal abundance. Is it getting larger or smaller? The population level is looking at everybody's slices, the size of the pie, the size of the slice and the size of the pie. What's happening, okay? So when we think about this population resource abundance, that's the global abundance on the planet. It's really equal to this personal size of the slice times how many people? times of population. So from 1980 to 2020, population increased 75.8%. Went from 4.4 billion up to 7.8 billion. So we've, we've had 75% increase in population. So when we think about that, size of the slice times the number of people gives us the size of the pot. Okay? So this index, now we can build the index and look at what total resource we had on the planet in 1980 compared to the size of the resource we had in 2020. And what did we find there? Well, personal resource abundance went from one to 4.03, right? I get one basket in 1980. 2020, I get four baskets for the same time. So my abundance, my personal abundance is increased by 303%. Population increases from 4.3 up to 7.8. So you've got these two factors. When we multiply it down here, here's the size of the pie in 1980, 4.43. That's the size of the pie in 2020. It's increased by what? 608%, okay? So you got 300% more abundance, personal abundance. Your slice got three times, your slice is four times larger than it was in 1980, but you also have 75% more people in the plan, okay? So from that respect, we start the index at a value of 100. It's moved up to a value of 708. That gives us a 608% percentage change. That's indicating that the planet is getting about 5% richer every year. At that rate, we double global abundance every 14 years. Okay? Now, we take all that and kind of put it back together in a little chart here. This is percentage change. And this is the year from 1980 to 2020. First of all, time prices did what? They declined by 75%. Now it's hard to think about percentage decreases because it gets kind of confusing after you get up to about 60, 70, 80% because it's hard for people to convert that price into abundance. And we actually did that relationship, right? The reciprocal relationship. And if you have, the other thing is what happens when the price Got to play 100%. You get a bust. It's free. No, you don't go bust. <laughs> Everything's free. Yeah. All right. Uh -huh. So your abundance goes to infinity. All right. So we do this conversion here. We did this time price, and you kind of see it dropping down to 75%. If we look at the personal abundance, it's actually increased 300%. Now you'll notice in this chart, you'll see this period of ups and downs. And Julian Simon said you would see this. You expect to have these temporary shortages that cause prices to go up in those particular markets. But what's the overall trend? The overall trend is that it's the underlying trend continues to have this positive feature to it. So that's personal abundance. Prices go down by 75%, means I get four for one. We add population to that. What's population? Well, interesting, the population looks linear here, right? So Malthus said what? He said population is going ge ge geometric. It looks like it's kind of linear in terms of just human beings. But resources are doing what? 
resources you're going to emit. So if we multiply the personal, your slice by the population, what do we get? We get this. Thing. Okay. Now, I'm going to skip over this part here. <coughs> Another way we can think about it. Let's graph this. This population on the horizontal, let's put your basic 50 multiplied. 1980, we're going to index this to one. So a one by one box. So your size of your pie, 1980, was one. Now, uh, we go out to 2020, population's done what? Excuse me, your uh, resource abundance did what? We went from one up to 4.03. What did population do? Increases by 75%. So now the size of that box is this size. If I over overlay 1980 on 2020, you see the difference there? There's the size of the red, the red box is the size of the global resource pie in 1980. The green box is the size of the global resource pie in 2020. Once again, how did we get there? Go back and pick these 50 commodities, calculate the time price, and then multiply it times the population. That gives us this global size. So we go from one, one, the 7.08, that's how we also get the 608 percent kind of figure that. Now there's some other numbers that we look at. These are elasticity equations. Elasticity is I'm going to look at this one variable and see what happens to this other variable. So in this case, what we want to do is compare what happens, what happened to the time price as population went up. Population goes up by 75%, time prices went down by 75%. It looks like every 1% increase in population yielded a 1% decrease in, in the time price of things. First elasticity. The second one is just look at personal abundance. My personal abundance went up by 300%, my population went up by 75%. That looks like every 1% increase in population corresponded to a 4% increase in my personal abundance. Then we look at global population, or global abundance, it went up by 600%, over 75% increase in population. So 1% increase in population corresponded to an 8% increase in global abundance. It's like these people are showing up and they're having this profound effect in terms of contribution. Let me get through this, hold on to your question. Okay, so what we call this is superabundance, where your slices are increasing faster than population. The size of your slice is increasing faster than population. So it's like these people show up, and not only does my slice get better, bigger, but all these people are also coming, their slices are getting better. All right, ready for quiz two? Okay, here we go. 1980, uh, you're, you're getting married, and your father is going to host a wedding reception for you, and he invites 100 guests, and the cost per plate is $10. What's he going to spend? It's not a trick question. You spent a thousand dollars, right? So now it's my turn, and I'm actually going to host a reception for my granddaughter. But the size of my family has increased. I have seventy-five percent more people, but the cost per plate has fallen by seventy-five percent. So here's the quiz: A. You don't say. Just think. A. Is the price going to be the same for me as my father? B. Is it going to be higher? Is it going to be higher by 43%? Uh, or C, is it going to be lower? Who said C? Somebody heard about C. <laughs> C is actually the correct answer. Sorry? And you get the Adam Smith tie. I don't know. Yeah. You, get the, <laughs> you have a friend? Oh, I have the book side. I guess I can join the book side. Okay, <laughs> you can sell it to somebody. There's a market value. Yeah. 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 Don't trade. I, I never refuse alcohol because I can always sell it to somebody. Right? <laughs> okay, so you got the math right. right? 1. 1. 175 times uh, 250. So it's interesting that this percentage increase is not the same thing as a percentage decrease. Percentages are weird when they go up and down. So be careful when we do percentages. What's interesting about this is what would you like to have happen? If this was really true, what would you like to have happen? Wouldn't you like even more people coming? No, better one. 
better wine. You'd like to be able to have more population because it looks like when you add more population, the total bill is going down, hmm. right? The total bill, the individual bill is going down, and the total bill is also going down. Okay? All right, so let's go back to these guys. Here's the argument that we make. We make the argument that they were, they were using the wrong level of analysis. They were thinking in atoms and they shouldn't be thinking in knowledge. So when we think in quantity, we're really just doing addition, right? Let's count up the loaves of bread on the shelf. Now, what's the first step to actually understanding things? Go from quantity to what? Price. Go to go to price. So go to price because price is going to do what? It's going to actually help you understand the value of things because you're going to start seeing the relative scarcity of things in the price. And then the next step is go from money price to time price. Why do we like time prices? Because they're ratios. There's more information contained in a time price than a money price. And then the next level is to look at the change in time price over time. To do what? To do what? Uh, our friend Sir Isaac Newton did. Do calculus, do the rate of change over time. If they had, they were, they were kind of focused on this arithmetic. They were focused on the addition level. Where do they need to be? Where do we need to be to really analyze this? We need to be at the calculus level where we're really looking at this rate of change over time. All right, so I want to share with you what time we go. And time price. We're time. <laughs> okay, real quick. Now, if you're curious about this, there's an American author at MIT that just wrote this book called uh, More from Less. And if you're curious about it, he writes this book and he explains that we're having this abundance occur in the US where we're actually using less of all of these things stone and cement and gold, uh, less today than we used in at the turn of the century. So, how is it that our GDP could be going up? That our population could be going up, but we're using less and less of these items. Is that, yeah, <laughs> because knowledge is doing well. Knowledge is growing faster than population. So it allows us to use fewer and fewer elements. He describes it as dematerialization. I prefer to use uh, intelligizing. We're intelligizing these atoms. We're putting them together in new ways that allow us to actually create something more and more valuable. Think about a car, uh, Cesar Hildago. Uh, this economist uses this great story where he says, you've got this beautiful sports car, Bugatti, and it's worth thousands of dollars per pound. And you take it out and you have this accident and you go, well, uh, what's happened? Well, all the atoms are still there, but the value has disappeared. Doesn't that tell you something about the information value of those atoms, the arrangement of those atoms are what makes things valuable and discovering new ways to arrange atoms Musical notes, uh, paint on a on a picture, bits and software. That's where the value gets created. Uh, he also makes this interesting observation. He says that modern society can amass large amounts of productive knowledge because uh, it distributes bits and pieces of knowledge among its many members. What does that sound like? All right, Hayek is talking about Hayek's idea of knowledge. But then he draws this other interesting uh, conclusion and says, but to make use of it, this knowledge has to be put back together through organizations and markets. You have a way to, to bring this knowledge together so it can create a product and it can actually be tested in a market. So this beautiful explanation about how knowledge grows, but it also has to be organized in a way that people can then assign value to it. So um, McAfee put up $100,000 to bet on the future. He says in 2029, the US will be using less metals, mm -hmm. materials, timber, paper, mm -hmm. fertilizer, water, energy, less cropland, and lower greenhouse gases. If you think he's wrong, go make yourself some money. Mm -hmm. But I warn you, early <laughs> try this. Go to longbets.com and you'll find the site you can bet on. So, but if you think that I'm just kind of maybe pessimistic a little bit, uh, let's talk about climate and families. Here's a chart that shows climate-related deaths. And uh, Bjorn Lomborg, we all know this guy, he's, he's, he actually did this chart. So back in 1920, we had uh, 
about 485,000 deaths due to climate. And this was, this was climate, it wasn't, uh, um, it was storms and droughts and uh, uh, it was climate. It wasn't earthquakes and tsunamis, it was climate. Things are getting too hot or too cold, too wet or too dry. And what did he, what did he show here? He's showing this trend. But this is the total, you gotta adjust it for what? For population sizes. So by the time you do that, you see that we went from 248,000 per billion to only 778. So we've had about a 99.7% decrease in risk due to climate. We can also look at it this way. Here's the climate deaths. There's the population. There's the rate per billion. This is the rate per Billion. What should we compare these two numbers? What's happened to those two numbers? The other way that you can think about it is what's this ratio over that ratio? It's one to 320. So 320 people died in adjusted for population in 1920. We'll have one person die today. So we've had this abundance of, 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 of safety that's kind of also emerged, right? Do you worry about climate today? Yeah. Really, we're worried about dying from climate. Okay, so we have this interesting relationship between this reduction in risk and this increase in abundance of safety. And you notice this is linear, and that's law. Okay, all right. What about famines? Well, people die from famines. The highest record we have is back in the 1870s. We had these famines that occurred in China. In India, we had 20 million people die. And you notice the trend starts to go down. Starts to go down, and then suddenly, 1920s, it pops back up. What happened? Communism. Yeah, the Marxists showed up. <laughs> <laughs> the Marxists showed up, yeah. and the Nazis show up, and we have this period of four decades of this, of this huge yeah. uh, famine, man-induced famine, Marx-induced famine. And then we recover, and we start to move back down. How many people die of famine today? Natural famine. So if we look at that the rate, here's the population going up. Here's this rate going down. This green line that I plotted in here assumes you didn't have marks. <laughs> we start here and we go like this. Yeah. What that say? Mm. He said, you know, we won't need what we need is more markets and less marks. Mm. <laughs> if you want to, if you want to reduce famine. And there's the table that supports that. All right, mm. interesting there. Uh, Survival rate increase from one to four. We had a forty thousand percent increase in people's ability to avoid famine since eighteen seventy. Okay, all right. Probably the fastest learning curve that we've we've been able to observe is this learning curve for DNA sequencing. And you guys had something to do with that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So look at that learning curve. Now this is logarithmic, so this is Moore's law. Remember what Moore's law says? Mm -hmm. This is every year or so you kind of drop your cost by by half. Uh, it's not a function of time, it's a function of the chips that you're making, right? Every time you make a chip and you use a chip, you learn how to make the chip cheaper and faster and better. So there's Moore's law, which has kind of been the, the gold standard of fast development. Look what's happening to DNA sequencing. So the guy who been following this. Um, the director, it cost about a billion dollars to get your sequence done when it first became mm. available. Today, it's dropped to a thousand dollars. And there's a Chinese company, mm. and they're objecting using robots to try to get it down to a hundred dollars. Mm. So I go from a billion dollars down to a hundred dollars. Now imagine what that's going to do for all of us. A hundred bucks, I get my sequence. Huh, that might be kind of interesting. Okay. So that growth, if you look at the growth rates, is about 130% a year worth of compound annual growth. So we got this curve that's it's almost going vertical. Okay, remember this guy? He introduces the iPhone. Yeah, what did he say? Okay, introduces this iPhone. <clears throat> I think it's the most creative, destructive device that's ever been. Mm. I, I truly do. Um, but today, 80% of the planet has been mobilized that have some kind of device that allows them to connect to the 
That's a phenomenal number when you think about it. Other tools that we have that are, that are astonishing in terms of our ability to grow knowledge. You might know this guy. He's another guy from here. Stephen Wolfram uh, developed this language called Mathematics. He has this program called Wolfram Alpha. But he's got 10 trillion pieces of data, and he uses this Mathematica program to help you analyze. It's like Google with a calculator. I encourage you to go look at it. They have a free version, or you can, uh, you can actually get a paid version. It's like 18 pence a day. And so phenomenal ability to access knowledge and analyze knowledge. Another guy that's really Is that knowledge or information? Well, what is the difference between knowledge and knowledge? Huge. Okay, I'll give you my short answer. You got information. Information connected to human intelligence is knowledge. Okay? That's my short answer. <laughs> this guy here, he went to and scanned 107 million journal articles. And he actually made these uh, uh, word strings. And uh, from that, he's got 355 billion word strings and sentence fragments. So he's got 38 terabytes that he's basically published for free. You can download. So you can go buy yourself a, a what a 40 terabyte hard drive. Go download this. Hard drive is about 1500. You can have all these journals for 1500 dollars that are searchable. It's not just a journal; it's searchable. So the index that we really need to be thinking about is knowledge per hour. What kind of knowledge can we produce per hour on the planet? It takes two things. It takes human beings and it takes freedom for these human beings to be able to act on their ideas. Not only creating products, but then being able to take those products to a market where a market can actually help them determine if they created value or not. Okay? All right, back to population. Jordan Peterson makes this interesting statement. Where does this knowledge come from? It comes from you and I. That's the only place we've been able to discover where knowledge comes from. It's other human beings. If you're in favor of a more prosperous planet, uh, a more healthy planet, a more safe planet, what do you have to be in favor of? You got to be in favor of more people. More people that have the freedom to create knowledge, to learn and create knowledge. So Peterson makes this statement. He says, there's no sentiment more implicitly genocidal than the statement the planet has too many people on it. Yeah, this, this virus that's affected you. I think it's the most deadly virus that we have on the planet that we, we live in this world of scarcity. We don't live in a world of scarcity. We live in a world of abundance because knowledge is how we convert these scarcities mm -hmm. to abundance. This guy Elon Musk did an interview with Wall Street Journal. And what he said, it's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. There are not enough people. I can't emphasize this enough. And I think one of the biggest risks to civilization is the low birth rate and the rapidly declining birth rate. How many and children has he got? He's only got seven. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he kind of lived what he said. Right? <laughs> He's only got seven. Anybody know this place? 2066 Chris Drive in Los Altos, California. Well, this little kid was adopted. And uh, this is where he grew up, and he grew up, and he got another friend, and his other friend's name was also Steve. Steve Jones. Uh, and his little company started in 1976 and went from zero to somewhere around 2.7 trillion today. <laughs> and that indicates about a 90% compounded annual growth rate. From there. Now, Apple's done this, but what's it done overall? Mm. Yeah, it continues to thrive and grow because Apple's what? Apple's an innovation company. They know that they've got to be able to come up with new ideas, find the very best thinkers on the planet, and bring them into their organization, or be able to develop a relationship with them. Every one of us here has something to do with the iPhone world. Every one of us. I was in Saudi Arabia for three years, and I told my Saudi students, hey, you guys are part of the iPhone world. And they'd say, what do you mean? Here's my point of view. There it is. Yeah. What do you mean? Well, you know, <laughs> we take these iPhones and we assemble them where? You look at the back of your iPhone. Where is it made? China. Take a look at it. I don't think it says it's made in China. I think it says it's assembled in China, not it's made in China. China. You've got over 200 companies that Apple's been able to figure out how to cooperate with each other and send all these parts to China. China assembles it 
charge this apple about six dollars to assemble it. And then they ship it to the US. What's it cost them to ship it to the US? What's it cost to ship an iPhone from China, their factory, the Foxconn factory in China, to FedEx's uh, depot in Tennessee? What's the guess? Three. Sixty dollars? A dollar? Three. It's 54 cents. Oh. It costs about $250,000 to actually charter 737. About 80% of that cost is fuel. And where does that fuel come from? Well, 20% of the fuel on the planet comes from Saudi Arabia. So the Saudis are contributing to the development of the iPhone universe that we live in. All right. So Steve Jobs. His father was actually from Syria. His biological father was Syrian. He was adopted by this family in California. And he got to grow up in, in Silicon Valley. What would the world be like today if Steve Jobs had grown up in Syria? It might be peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> it might be. There's a probability that that could happen. But I think, my, I think your life and I think my life would be much different. So here's a question for you. How many Steve Jobs are in Syria today? Oh, there's quite a lot. In, in Ukraine, in Russia. These seeds are all over the planet, right? These human beings are all over the planet. We don't know which one is actually going to have these ideas that's actually going to create this tremendous value for the rest of us. Now, when we have more people, what happens to the, to the tails? The tails on the distribution is what we're interested in because those tails contain this potential for these people to have these ideas. Can I get stars? I got 30 more seconds. Let me hear any questions, okay? All right, I'm coming over here and I, I drive by this beautiful British Natural History Museum. And guess what I saw on the sign up? Closed. <laughs> I got this sign that says, Our Broken Planet. And I'm thinking, how does our broken planet reconcile with the data that I'm looking at? And what I would just tell you is, I don't think we have a broken planet. I think we have a broken set of ideas. This idea, this ideology of scarcity is really descended and put a cloud over the planet that we're so worried about scarcity that we haven't been able to look at the facts and look at the future of what we could truly create if we were able to recognize that each person on the planet has this ability to contribute something that all of us can enjoy. Because when you create knowledge and I share that knowledge with you, do I lose that knowledge? No, in fact, now both of us have the knowledge and it actually could become even more valuable. So if we look upon each other as fellow value creators, it changes our whole perspective. So I just, one more thing, almost forgot. There's our book we're going to try to get out here this summer. So we go into the framework. We look at we look at 18 different data sets. I've just described one of them, the Simon the Basic 50. We look at 18 different data sets. And what we found really astonished us. We want to share that. We open it down. So that's my story. Thank you very much. Thank you.